Hi everyone, welcome to Cancer Healing Journey Talks. Myself Sonali Modi from Community Outreach Team of ZenOnco.io and Love Heals Cancer. We guide cancer patients on adopting an integrative oncology treatment approach. We help them find the balance between medical treatment and complementary treatment therapies. We help our patients with our team of oncologists, lab experts, nutritionists, and other healthcare professionals so that we can improve the treatment outcome for patients. We also help in connecting patients with other cancer warriors who are going through this journey currently to address their queries. And we also share inspirational journeys to motivate cancer warriors who are going through this journey currently to inspire others. So firstly, I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Ms. Alison Rosen. She's a cancer warrior. I'm happy that you're here with us today to share your story. So over to you, Alison. Please start with your introduction. Sure. So I am Alison Rosen. I am a nine-year colorectal cancer survivor. Um, I currently live in Houston, Texas, and um, I am an advocate for colorectal cancer um, for adolescents and young adults or, or anyone that's gone through, going through, um, and, and might go through um, cancer treatment because uh, obviously it was unexpected um, mm -hmm. for me when I was first diagnosed. Yeah, so like what made you go for the diagnosis and what were the initial symptoms? Yeah, so I, I actually was at the time was working in cancer research. So I'm, I was very aware of, of various cancers, various symptoms, various things related to cancer, but um, I have Crohn's disease. So I sort of been very in tune with my body, but I had been in remission from my Crohn's for quite a few years and was just going in for yearly, yearly colonoscopies. Um, about six months before I was diagnosed, I noticed symptoms that were a little unusual for me. Um, I was in the best shape of my life, but I was losing weight, not because of working out, but obviously I realize now it was because of the cancer. So I was losing weight. Um, I was low energy. Um, and I thought that was also because I was working out quite a bit. I was doing Zumba seven days a week. And when I would get home, I would just fall asleep. Um, what really sort of triggered it besides the fatigue and the weight loss that I thought was from exercise was um, when I was eating, I felt like food was getting stuck inside me and I had really bad abdominal pain. And throughout my, my Crohn's journey, you know, I didn't really have issues with that. I would eat normal and and, and whatnot. It was mainly, you know, sometimes pain when I went to the bathroom, but for this, it was like, I was eating, I had felt like horrible heartburn. It felt like food was stuck inside me and no one could really explain that pain or what was going on with that. Um, I also was anemic. It turned out I had a blood test and I was anemic. So I was losing blood. Um, it just wasn't necessarily um, visible to, to the naked eye. So I think all of that prompted me to talk to my doctor. Yeah. So like, uh, can you share like how this news was disclosed to you and how your family reacted to this news? Sure. Um, it was probably the worst day of my life. It's something I'll never, never really forget. But essentially, I had all these symptoms. I went in for a colonoscopy after some some tests that didn't show anything. And and so I didn't get the news when I was diagnosed when I had the colonoscopy. So I had this colonoscopy, woke up from it. My doctor said, well, I'm not sure what's going on. It looks like you might have some sort of blockage. Um, there definitely is some sort of growth of some sort. Um, we did some some biopsies and we'll let you know. I don't think it's cancer, but um, you know, we'll let you know. And you know, she used the word cancer. So for me, I just was like in a blur. The next two days were just kind of like, uh, I need to get these results. So two days later, she called me and asked me to come over to her office. She put me in a very dark room and told me that I had colorectal cancer. She said she didn't know the stage, but she said, I need to find an oncologist and surgeon right away. And then she said, and I'll leave you in the room just to sort of like digest all this. So I don't think it was the best way to tell somebody that they had cancer. Um, I also don't know. Um, I mean, I, you know, there's not really a good way to tell someone they have cancer, but also like when someone gets this news, it's just shocking. So someone should be there, a case manager, a social worker, a nurse, somebody to hold their hand and just be there. Um, because at that point, like my life flashed before my eyes and I was like, okay, well, um, I wasn't expecting to go through cancer, um, at the age of 32, but I guess I'm going to have to figure out how to get a doctor. She also told me she was leaving her practice in a week. So I had to find a new gastroenterologist at the same time. So I think I was in a sense of shock. You know, I saw, I, I visibly, like I visibly can remember um, seeing my childhood and my adolescence and 
like my teenage years, like flash before my eyes. I just, I didn't think I was going to live. Um, I obviously was like, okay, I'm determined to, to do whatever I need to do. But when someone tells you you have cancer for me in my mind, that just meant I'm, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. Yeah. Because cancer is a big thing and we always require some solid support system. So who yeah. was your support system along with the family? Um, I got so much support and I'm very, very lucky. Um, I live in Houston. My parents live in Houston. So they were my primary caregivers. Um, mm -hmm. I also worked in, in cancer research. So I had a lot of friends that I knew from my, I had been in the lab for seven years at this point. I knew people from my current lab and some people from my lab um, in stem cell biology were working over at in some cancer hospitals, as well as I grew up. So I had friends from growing up, I had friends from high school, I had friends from college. So I had a very tight knit support system. The one thing I realized at the very beginning that I was missing that I asked for was I wanted to talk to other cancer survivors. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anyone else that had cancer, let alone anybody young. Like my mom had cancer, like in her forties, late forties, early fifties. And, you know, I think, I think cancer, I think it's, it's, older people. I don't necessarily think younger people getting it, let alone colorectal cancer. So the first thing I asked my surgeon when I went in for that first appointment was, can you introduce me or figure out a way that I can talk to someone else that has gone through what I'm about to go through so I can get support and advice from someone like that? Mm -hmm. Like what yeah. treatment? Yeah. So what okay. treatment have you? Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so what treatment have you undergone like uh hmm. yeah share your so, experience uh, during the treatment time so i um when i was first diagnosed it was um again unsure what what stage i was but so my treatment plan was going to be chemotherapy and radiation at the same time so i did five and a half weeks of chemotherapy and radiation i had a little bit of break for my body to heal a little bit and then i had surgery and the surgery could have been many different things. They could have taken my whole colon. They could have taken part of my colon. I could end up with a permanent ostomy, a temporary ostomy, a J pouch. I ended up having my whole colon removed because of years of disease from my Crohn's. And I had a temporary ileostomy made at that point in time. And then I was allowed to heal from that. And then I had chemotherapy again. And, you know, that wasn't the end of my treatment, but that was essentially after that I had scans. And, and they said I was cancer free because they took the whole colon out, but, but I had complications and lots of different issues the next few years regarding, you know, radiation effects, chemotherapy effects, and then that ileostomy that was reversed at one point had to be made permanent. So I now live with a, a permanent ileostomy and, you know, we could talk for an hour about that, but, but overall it was chemotherapy, radiation. I had three surgeries and ended up with a permanent ileostomy. Yeah, so like how many chemotherapy cycles and radiation therapy cycles you went through? Oh, I wish I knew the exact number. Um, it, the, it was five and a half weeks. So I was on chemo pills. I didn't have to do infusions. Um, mm -hmm. So I was taking chemo pills along with the five and a half weeks. Of, so it was five and a half weeks of chemo and radiation at the same time. And I think I was taking, um, if my memory corrects me, two or three of the chemo pills at once. And then again, I had that break and I went back on to the oral chemo um, after for, oof, I want to say maybe October, like um, another six or eight weeks was that, that chemo again. Hmm. So like chemotherapy is a very tough routine. So can you share your experience, like how you coped with it and what all difficulties you faced during the treatment? Yeah, I mean, I faced a lot of the same treatments or a lot of the same side effects that a lot of a cancer patients face. So chemo brain was huge for me. My memory was was really, I mean, it's still not recovered fully. I'm not going to lie. I, there's certain things I can't remember. Um, I dealt with nausea quite a bit. I dealt with pain. Pain was huge for me. Pain management, trying to figure out the day-to-day -day, um, ways to make sure I wasn't in pain. I dealt with neuropathy. Um, extreme weight loss. So I lost, I don't know, I think I lost about 40 pounds throughout my treatment. And so I just had no energy. Um, so it was a lot of neuropathy, cold sensitivity, hot sensitivity, um, pain. Um, I lost my hair. Um, so that all fell out. Um, 
and just dealing with the ostomy day, day in, day out. So my skin had irritation and, you know, I, I had to figure out how to deal with, with that, um, which was a, a beast in and of its own. So um, I had kidney issues as well. So unfortunately I had um, fluid build up around my kidneys. So I had to have something called nephrostomy tubes quite a bit. I, I think I've had them four or five times now where they have to put tubes through my back to drain the fluid that's built up around my kidneys. So one doesn't function really well. The other one sort of is making up for that. Um, but unfortunately that's sort of a long-term issue. I have to deal with kidney, kidney infections on a regular basis. And, and um, just if something is not right, I still, again, see my doctor now um, about that. And that most likely is due to the re- radiation that I had to my, um, you know, my abdomen and pelvis area. Yeah. So like, what do people need to expect when they get this cancer type? I mean, it's different for everybody. Um, I was stage two colorectal cancer, but, um, you know, it's different depending on the type of surgery, depending on the type of treatment. I will Mm -hmm. say that, that various things that helped me was don't say no to pain medicine The you need the energy to recover. And, and I essentially had to learn to walk again after I was cut open some surgeries are laparoscopic. I couldn't have laparoscopic surgery. So I was all three times was, were open surgeries for me. So I think taking the pain medicine, giving yourself grace and taking the time out to fully recover from that um, is huge. Also, if you have radiation, this is like the number one thing I tell people, if you have pelvic radiation, go and ask your doctor about pelvic floor therapy because long-term effects of radiation in, in that area can affect your sexual health and can also just affect your day-to-day, you know, habits. So, so talk to your doctor about pelvic floor therapy. I also think that, that during treatment, controlling the, my nausea, like I tried so many different combinations of medicine, you'll eventually find something that works for you. Um, and I did, and also, um, ostomy support. If you have to have an ostomy related to colorectal cancer, even a temporary one, there are support systems like United Ostomy Associations of America that have support groups all over the world. And they also have an ostomy association in Canada. And there, there might be some like near you, just look up ostomy support. And even if there's not one necessarily in your country, they're all virtual now due to COVID. So it's great. So you can hop on um, a support group and talk to people that have had, have had ostomies for 20, 30 years. And these people have all the support that you could possibly need. The other thing I will talk about is fertility. So if you're young and want to have children, talk about fertility preservation before you start your treatment, because after you, if you have radiation or chemotherapy, the likelihood of having children after is not likely. I can't have children. So I either have to adopt or, or figure out another way to have children, which, you know, might be in my future, might not, but I can't naturally have children. And, and then the other thing is um, take care of your mental health. That's huge. And I, I talk to people about that a lot. So I attend a young adult support group um, every two weeks. Still, I see a psychologist every, you know, it used to be every month when I was going through treatment. Now she's just available when I need her. But I've seen the same person for nine years and she's helped me still now, helps me. Um, and, and try to figure out what your new normal is. And I don't really love the word new normal but like figure out what makes you happy and, and do that. I switched careers. I was working in research and now I'm in, I'm still in cancer, but I work in cancer prevention and community outreach and education where I get to use my story and my journey to help others. And so that more is up my alley. That more is, is what my passion is. And that changed because of everything that I went through. Hmm. So like, uh, what is the importance of self-examination and why? Because often people skip this. They often, people prioritize things. So often they prioritize their family, their friends, everyone around them, but they don't prioritize themselves. And especially women, they uh, take care of everyone, but uh, they forget to take care of themselves. So it's very important to have self-examinations on a daily basis. So what do you want to say about this? I say that, you know, as a woman, um, you're not doing a, a, you're not, you're doing a disservice to your friends, to your family by not taking care of yourself. Yes, other things might be priorities, but especially with colorectal cancer, if you think something is wrong or if you're of age for that screening or you have a family history or just something seems off, 
you know, unexpected weight loss, blood in your stool, abdominal pain, just certain things. If you have any of the symptoms I mentioned earlier, as well as if you're 45 or older, or you have Crohn's or colitis, or you have any genetic, um, you know, genetic conditions, or you have a family history of colorectal cancer, you need to get screened, if not for yourself or your family. So you can be there for your husband, for your wife, your friends, for your parents, and for your kids. So the best thing you can do as a, a human being is to take care of yourself. You can put some things off, the groceries can wait, but screening for cancer cannot wait because it can save your life. If you have a screening and you know, if you get diagnosed with stage one colorectal cancer, here's an example, 90% prevent, or 90, 90% beatable, 90%. If you get diagnosed with stage four, 14% beatable. That's a huge difference. And, and that can make, that can be the difference between if you see blood in your stool, if you start having these symptoms and not doing anything within a year, within a few months, that can make a difference. Yeah. So did you weigh in lifestyle changes during after the treatment? Yeah, I mean, lifestyle changes, definitely. Um, before cancer, I'm not gonna lie, I was going out with my friend, partying, having a really good time. And life just was like, it, it, I, was, I took it seriously. Obviously I had a job and, and whatnot, but lifestyle, I, I eat healthier now. I exercise, I go to a trainer two times a week. I work out. So I try to prioritize my, my, my body, mind, and soul. So eating right, working out, not taking life for granted. So I seize every opportunity to be able to tell my story like this so I can help others. Uh, I take care of my mental health. Um, and I also, the people in my life, I um, choose certain people to be in my life that make me happy. I don't like to surround myself with anyone that... Um, creates drama unnecessary because that's not good for your mental health. So, you know, I think my lifestyle is, is healthier, happier, and, and overall just trying to live life to the fullest because it's precious and you don't know what will happen tomorrow. Yeah. So like what all things helped you in your recovery? Ah, oh, so much helped me in my recovery. I think the biggest thing was support. Um, and I, I touched on this earlier. I asked to talk to a stranger. Um, well, I asked just to talk to anyone that understood me. And so I got connected with someone through MD Anderson Cancer Center where I was treated. This was someone that had had the same surgery as me, had gone through the same treatment as me. And she basically helped me all different aspects of my, my treatment. I would be like, hey, what's go? I, I don't understand. Like I'm in pain and this pain med medicine isn't working. Hey, can I eat this with my ostomy? So I connected with her. And then that opened up the doors to a whole cancer community that existed. So connecting with other young adults, other colorectal cancer patients, other ostomates really made the difference in my recovery from not talking to anybody. Some people don't like to share. If you're just listen, um, it can make all the difference. I mean, having access to the resources or to, you know, reliable resources, not just going to Google. There are some things on Google that will scare the heck out of you. But going and finding the reliable resources, like patients that have gone through it, that want to be there for you and provide support for you, like changed everything for me. It's, it was such a healing process. And, I, you know, my support system, my friends, my family, amazing. I love them. But they didn't understand what I was going through like somebody else like that had gone through it. And, and so a combination of, you know, having the friends, the family and the medical team but then also having like this whole cancer community, we call ourselves blue family, essentially. We are family because we get each other and can talk about things that no one else can understand. Yeah. So every crisis in life teaches you a particular lesson. So what life lessons has this cancer journey taught you? I mean, I think similar to what I said, like you only have one life, so you've got to live it to the fullest, enjoy it, um, do what makes you happy. And don't take life for granted. Don't take people for granted in your life. Because, you know, I, I've made some friends that unfortunately mm -hmm. have passed away of colorectal cancer. And so every moment I got with them, I treasure because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You don't know what will happen. So I really like my life is, is, is there. I don't say no, unless I can't physically do it. I say yes. I say yes to the trip that that is my dream trip. I say yes to trying anything new. I've gone surfing and I didn't think I could ever go surfing. I skydived. 
I, I just went, I just got back a few weeks ago from Africa. It was my dream trip and I went with strangers. So I think my motto in life is try anything once. And, you know, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it again, but life is so, so precious. And, um, I want to, I don't want to have any regrets. And so I want to try everything, do everything, travel as many places as I can and meet as many people as I, as I, as I can as well, because I'm also fascinated by culture and by what goes on around me. I don't want to ever live in a silo. Yeah. So like, can you share your experience and thoughts about your caregivers? Uh, caregivers are so important. They could be anything from a best friend a husband or wife, a sister or a brother, a child, a parent. My parents were my caregivers and they were my lifeline. Um, I woke up from my first surgery and my dad was sitting next to me on my bed or in, in, the, in the couch next to my hospital bed. The next day, my mom came. After that, my dad came. My mom came. I moved in with them after I had my surgery for recovery for a few months until I was able to go back to my own condo because I was very independent, had my own life, had my own place, had my own everything, but cancer just, you know, knocked me down and I needed help. And so they, they dropped everything. My mom who used to travel quite a bit. She didn't travel. She was there for me for every single appointment. She came with me, um, you know, was there for me, took notes when I couldn't take notes, um, was an advocate when I couldn't be the advocate. And my dad, he's a medical professional. So he was my lifeline when I was like, this looks weird. What do I do? Um, so without my parents, I, I don't think I'd be here today. I'm not gonna lie. They, they were my advocates. Um, they were there every step of my journey and, and caregivers need support, just like patients need support. So, you know, I needed the, to talk to other patients. I introduced my mom to some other caregiver parents so she could talk to them because they, they take a, a lot of, a lot of, um, um, I, you know, you're on pain medicine, you're not the nicest and they take all that, they take all that on and don't care. They love you unconditionally. And so I would apologize if I was mean one day, but you know, it was the, it was the, maybe the steroid, the prednisone that I was taking. So I think caregivers are the unsung heroes, um, for cancer survivors and, and the cancer community. They are amazing. Yeah. So like, what was your first reaction when your reports were finally saying that you're cancer free? Oh my gosh, I cried. Um, I, I can't even, that, that moment that I was told I was cancer free was like, I didn't believe it. I pinched myself. I, um, I had a huge party. <laughs> I had everybody in my life over. It was like a end cancer party. It was the best. I don't know, one of the best moments to be able to share that with everyone that had, had been there for me throughout my cancer journey. And I knew like, even though you're cancer free, you still have a journey ahead of survivorship and everything. But at that moment I could celebrate, I did this. Uh, something I didn't know I could accomplish, I did. And so it was um, probably again, in the top, top moment of my life um, because now I knew that, that I could move on I could try to figure out what would make me happy. And even though I wouldn't be going every day or every week to the hospital, um, I still had all the doctors if I needed them, but I was sort of, uh, sort of like set free, I guess you could say. I had this, this weight on me for so long. And then I was told that the treatment had worked and I was cancer free. And I almost felt like a butterfly it's a weird analogy. It was not a weird analogy. My parents gave me this beautiful butterfly necklace that I don't have on right now, but I felt like I was in a cocoon during my treatment. And then when I was told I was cancer free, I broke out of that cocoon and turned into this butterfly that likes to travel the world and likes to do all sorts of different things and, um, and just is happy, go lucky and um, ready to explore and, and live life. Yeah. So do you still go for prescribed checkups after you are declared cancer-free? Yeah. So I go every year for, for scans. Um, for me, I had my last surgery to make my ileostomy permanent, I think about four years ago. So I will still go and see my surgery, my surgeon and oncologist every year. I do go and see many other doctors. I have an endocrinologist. I have a urologist. I have a gastroenterologist. I have a dermatologist. 
Um, so I do see a lot of other doctors, some of them more often than others, but especially a hundred percent yearly, I go and have all these checkups with gynecology. You know, I, I'm at higher risk for other cancers now. So I have a mammogram every year. I have a pap and I have my pap every year. I have a skin check every year. Um, I, I see all these doctors again, my, my, my urologist, I see more often because my kidneys are not in the best shape. So unfortunately I usually go there every few months. Um, but essentially for, for cancer checkups, it's once a year. Yeah. So do you think that cancer has changed you in a positive way? I do. Um, it gave me this perspective I didn't necessarily have before. I thought I was invincible. I would, you know, nothing ever bad would happen to me. And then, then I, I got cancer and it sort of knocked me down. But I also realized that I'm stronger than I thought I ever could possibly be. So I conquered cancer. That means in my mind, I can conquer anything. So it made me this person that is not shy to tell, to tell my story, to not talk to anyone in public, to, to not be shy about what I want and what I need. So if something isn't going right in my cancer treatment or I think something's wrong, I'm going to speak up and I'm going to find somebody that will listen. Um, and so it's changed me. I'm, I'm much more outgoing. I'm much more um, open and honest. And I'm much more, I guess, an adventure seeker um, because again, I want to try everything that life has to offer because I realize how precious it is now. Yeah. So have you ever asked yourself this question? Why me? And if yes, then how you cope up with this thought? I mean, why me happens quite a bit. Um, it happened more so at the beginning of the journey. Why me? Um, and, you know, it might be cliche, but um, now looking back, I am stronger than anybody I know. And I felt like I got it for some reason. You know, the world was, was, you know, decides who get in my mind, the world decides who get can, gets cancer and who doesn't might be genetics, might be other things, but, um, it, somehow I got it and I had the strength in order to survive it and live through it. And, um, you know, what I do with it now, the lessons I've learned and how I choose to live my life by helping others and dedicating my life to sharing my story and advocating and, and educating is, is sort of how I cope with that. Why me? I got it. Who knows why really, but what I do with it now is, is really the, the question. So some people go through cancer treatment, they're done. Um, they don't want to ever talk about it. I talk about it more than anybody else because I, I want to take the bad that I went through and help somebody else and, and change it into something good. Um, so if my journey can help anybody, then it was all worth it. Hmm. So like, how did you overcome your fear of treatment or side effects? You know, it was one day at a time. Um, I think there wasn't necessarily a fear because it was a fear of the unknown. I didn't necessarily know how I was going to feel. I, I did talk to other people to get a better understanding of, okay, I can't walk today. When am I going to be able to walk? This was after my first surgery. You know, I looked outside my room. I was the second day I got up out of my bed and like walked to the door. Well, I saw other people much older than me, like doing laps on the floor of the hospital wing. And I'm like, okay, it's obviously one day at a time. So I just, you know, conquered one thing at a time, one day at a time and knew eventually I would get to a point that I would be back to being able to do the things that I loved. It was also like, I think by talking to others, I realized there was lots of different things, integrative medicine. So I did restorative yoga. I, I, you know, changed my diet. Like I said, I try to eat healthier. So I tried to do everything that I could be in control of. There's some things that are out of our control, but anything I can control, I did so that I could have the best, so I could have, I can have the best survivorship possible. Yeah. So gratitude seems to be the biggest strength to fight the situation. So what were you ever so grateful for that always made you calm down after thinking or revisiting that memory? I mean, grateful for the people that I've met. Um, some of these people that I've met that were perfect strangers are, are some of my best friends now. So I'm grateful for the cancer community that exists. I'm grateful for the ostomy community. I'm grateful for the opportunities I've gotten to be able to share my journey. And, and all of that is healing. 
these people that weren't in my lives, they are in my lives. They will be in my lives. I won't let them go. They'll be in my lives forever. And I'm grateful for them because really they have been a lifeline besides my caregivers for me to be able to heal. I'm grateful for the hospital that saved my life. I'm grateful for all of the doctors that, that told me I wasn't just a number. I was important to them and they wanted to make sure I was taking care of myself and my journey was unique for me. So I, I have a lot to be grateful for. And, and, you know, I, I tell them often how grateful I am for them to be in my life. Yeah. So do you have the fear of reoccurrence? And if yes, then how you deal with it? I do. Um, every year when I have my scans, I have scan anxiety because, you know, that's just sort of natural as a cancer patient, cancer survivor, um, fear of recurrence. Uh, how I deal with it, I don't think about it. You know, any other time, it may be the week leading up to, um, to the, the scans and how I deal with it. I keep myself really busy. I am constantly busy doing anything and everything to live life to the fullest work, play. I go dancing. I just have fun with my friends. I travel. And then leading up, I, I think about that. I think about, you know, the possibility of it recurring. And, and then I calm myself down by meditating, by talking to my psychologist, talking to my support group. There's nothing that I can't control. I've done everything in my power to prevent it from coming back. Some things are out of our control. So if it ever does, I know I have an amazing support system of survivors, patients, and caregivers, as well as a medical, medical team that will take care of me um, again if I need them. So I just kind of breathe in and breathe out and some things are out of our control and that is one. Yeah. So what is an act of kindness that you will never forget? Uh, act of kindness. Um, so I think when I was first diagnosed, um, I was in that dark room like I was talking about and my gastroenterologist left me. She left me in this dark room and I was probably in there for a good 10 minutes, bawling my eyes out, crying. Um, I was talking to my parents on the phone, trying to figure out how I was going to get home and get my stuff from my job. And the nurse, the, the gastroenterology nurse came in and God, I'm going to cry. Um, she came in and she came and held my hand and she's like, it's going to be okay. You know, I'm still going to be here if you need anything. Um, I, I'm here if you have any questions, you have concerns. And she had a, um, a pink watch. Um, it was a breast cancer watch, nonetheless, but it was a pink watch that she had gotten um, from somebody because she was a breast cancer survivor. She took off her watch and she gave it to me. And she said, when you think of, you know, the hard times you were going through, I had this watch and it was sort of like a lifeline for me. So she gave me her watch in that moment. And I still have it. It's still, it's still, you know, in my jewelry box. And I remember that moment because she knew me, but not super well. But just the fact that she thought of me and gave me something that was special to her during her cancer journey that I could have throughout my cancer journey meant so much. And I had throughout my journey, there were so many moments that perfect strangers either said something to me or gave me something or were there for me in moments that that I didn't know I needed somebody, but they knew that I needed somebody. Yes, in such moments, it's very especially we will know that who are the people who actually care for us and actually support us. And those people hold a very special place in our life throughout our lifetime. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All of them, all of them have a piece in my heart. Yeah. So what would be a uh, one line message for the world? Oh my gosh, the world live life to the fullest. Do not take life for granted. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Yeah. So what do you think are the stigmas attached to cancer and the importance of awareness for it? I mean, the stigmas are horrible. I mean, with colorectal cancer, it's, it's not a pretty cancer, people think. But really, it's, it's, we go to the bathroom every day. It's something we do every single day. So prevention is, is huge. There are not a lot of cancers that are preventable through screening. And colorectal cancer is one. If you get your screening, if you know your body, if you, if you think when something's wrong, talk to your doctor, it is very preventable through screening. And if it's, if it's caught early, it's very beatable and treatable. So I think that, you know, there might be a negative stigma because you're talking about the bathroom and going, you know, going to the bathroom and looking in the, in the toilet, but it's something we do every day as a part of our lives. So forget that stigma and just realize that 
you could potentially be at risk. If you have a colon, you're at risk. It's plain and simple. If you have a colon, no matter what age, you could be at risk. So screening can save your life. So you can't ignore it. You have to have that screening. For, again, we talked about it earlier, for yourself, for your family, for your future. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So what are the things uh, you appreciate or love about yourself? I uh, appreciate and love about myself. Um, I love that I'm fearless. Um, I love that I have a sense of adventure. Um, and I love that I am a friend to everybody. I haven't really met anybody that I, I won't help or I can't help or, or if I can't help, I'll send to somebody else. So I know that people appreciate my, my openness, my honesty, and my open heart because it is open to anybody and anybody, anybody anywhere that needs something. Again, if, if I don't have the resource or I don't, can't help them myself, I have a wide network of people throughout the world that I can help connect people to. And so I think that um, that's something that a lot of people know about me and, and hopefully more people will know about it now after they listen to this. Yeah. So one thing on your bucket list. I, mean, I accomplished number one on my bucket list, which was Africa. I just did that. Um, I got back in October. So that was, that was sort of number one. I think um, my next thing on my bucket list is to, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's so hard. I think I want to, I'm, I'm single. Uh, my bucket list is to find somebody and, and start a family. That is, that is number two. Yeah. So what message you would want to give to other cancer patients and caregivers? I mean, the message is you're not alone. You're not alone and you are your own best advocate. Um, if you think something is wrong, if you have a side effect that nobody's listening to you about, find somebody that will listen to you. And then again, you're not alone. You don't have to do this alone. There are so many people that want to um, and can help you throughout your journey, either mentally or physically. So just, just you know, reach out if you need that support because you might feel like you don't, but it makes all of the difference to have somebody, even a stranger, listen to you when something is not going right. Yeah. So if you have to sum up your journey in one sentence, then what would that be? Wow. Um, one sentence, my cancer journey. Um, um, I guess I could say I was small and mighty, but I packed a big punch and conquered cancer. Yeah. So, you know, your story is really inspiring. And I hope uh, this session really motivates people out there who are traveling or who have traveled through this journey. So it was lovely having you here today on the session with us, Alison. And uh, thank you so much for your valuable time. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for listening.